Okay, so next we are uh, mapping the field of digital identity and well-being with, um, oh, are you Julie or? <laughs> Julianne. Julianne, hello. Yes, Julianne, <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, I'll take this off. Right, good afternoon. I'm going to talk to you about mapping the territory of digital well-being education. And this is work that Chrissa Famelis and I have been carrying out as part of a, a European-funded research project funded under the, the Erasmus Plus programme. Um, first of all, I'm going to start by putting a question out there for you to, for you to think about while I'm giving this presentation. Um, Google has recently produced um, some digital well-being tips and tools and it's um, advice and apps that you can use on your phone to monitor your digital usage, monitor how long you're spending um, on your phone, what apps you're using. So it's providing you with feedback so that you can take responsibility for your own digital well-being. Um, Mozilla have also got some web pages and they, their internet health uh, discusses issues such as uh, information security and um, digital inclusion and openness and of course privacy and security which is very important. So who is responsible for our digital well-being? Is it ourselves? Is it just ourselves? Or is it technical technology companies? Is it institutions like higher education institutions? Is it governments? Um, GDPR, of course, has, uh, as, you know, is the government's help for digital security. Um, but how much is it our responsibility? So that's what I want you to think about. So the Digital Wellbeing Educators Project has the intention to build the capacity of teaching staff in higher education institutions to deliver digital education and promote the digital well-being of students. Um, the first element of this research project that I'm going to talk about here is the mapping of the territory of digital well-being education. And we've done that through, an, through looking at the educational literature and the practice that is going on in, in higher education institutions. We do focus just on higher education institutions. Um, I know there's a lot of work that has gone on in schools, especially secondary schools. Um, but we are taking uh, the focus purely on higher education at the moment. Um, we have also carried out interviews with staff who have delivered digital well-being interventions. Um, they may be researchers, they may be practitioners, they may be both. Um, and we've analysed those 10 interviews and looked at the challenges, risks and opportunities that came out of the analysis. So that's what I'll talk to you about. That's what I'll focus on today. We do have a report which includes the full literature review and it's got case studies of digital wellbeing interventions that have been carried out um, in higher education. We don't just focus on higher education in the UK because it is funded by the European Commission and we have an international collaboration which involves um, partners from Ireland, Spain and Denmark. So we do take an international focus. The definition of digital well-being that we have used is taken from the GIST Digital Capability Framework and you can see that there, the blue line which encompasses everything is uh, digital identity and digital well-being. Um, the definition, I won't read it all out because that, I'll just pick out some of the, the relevant points. Um, the definition covers personal health, safety, relationships and work-life balance. Um, the idea of balance in, uh, between the digital world and your real world is uh, quite important there and issues of workload, overload um, and distraction. They're personal, um, personal uh, features but they also look at how you negotiate and resolve conflict with others. So there's also this community aspect um, 
to the notion of digital well-being. So that's more than the, the, the definition that, that seems to be behind Google's tips and tools. So we interviewed 10 people, we analyzed the data, we've looked at the literature, um, and we've looked at the practice that's going on currently in, in higher education institutions in, in Europe. And we came up with um, uh, several themes. I'm only picking out some of the main themes. There's an awful lot more that's, that's in the report. Um, but the main themes that came out in terms of challenges for digital well-being research was that there's a lack of studies that evaluate changes in habits, beliefs, and attitudes. It's not that there's a lack of studies. There are studies that evaluate the impact of digital interventions, but they tend to focus on knowledge acquisition. You know, the educational goal. Have you managed to teach something about digital well-being? So that may have improved people's understanding and awareness of digital well-being, but has it actually had an effect on their beliefs, their attitudes, and most importantly, their behaviors and their habits. Um, secondly, it's a multidisciplinary field, so that can be a challenge. Um, it covers psychology, philosophy, sociology, education, um, and it's not always very easy for one individual to, to access all those fields. And thirdly, the lack of an agreed definition on what is digital well-being. Um, Google has a focus that it's mainly about personal responsibility, it's about the distractibility, um, whereas the GIST definition broadens that out, and it's not just your, your relationship with the technology, it's also about your relationship with other people through the technology. So that that's involves the community. Um, however, at the University of Milan, they have a digital well-being center, and GUI and colleagues there are sociologists, and their definition of digital well-being has um, a much stronger emphasis on the effect that uh, society and the norms and practices within a community or a society have on your own digital well-being and on how you manage your digital well-being. Um, to, to give an example of that, you might have um, normal practices that are there for your, your learning community. Um, you might have a code of conduct of what's expected of people while they're using a learning environment. So while I'm talking about this, I mean, a lot of it is, is relevant to any kind of use of digital tools but I'm mainly focusing on how it's used in an educational setting. Okay, secondly, the risks. Um, I've mentioned some of the risks already about attention and distraction. Um, there's a lot of talk in the media about how mobile phones are bad in schools because they're distracting the kids from the learning. Um, you know, there's, there's always tales of of the distraction uh, of students sitting in lecture theatres who are not focusing perhaps on the, the speaker but are uh, on social media. Um, so there, there's a lot of scaremongering um, about distraction and addiction. In fact, what we, what we found it were that um, um, Addiction is not really addiction, if you know what I mean. You don't, but anyway. <laughs> um, there was a paper um, published earlier this year by Arden and his colleagues which said that, you know, uh, smartphone addiction is a myth. It's not there. It's not really addiction. Um, so the distractibility and the addiction affect you personally and of course that might lead to stress lack of sleep and a sedentary lifestyle these things are mentioned in the media frequently um, in terms of a community setting you you see things like cyber bullying and cyber security and of course fake news and the cambridge analytica scandal last year um, 
where data was stolen from Facebook is, of course, also in the media. Um, and these can have an effect on our democracy, on our human rights, and um, the targeting of particular uh, social groups or particular people through the use of big data um, can have effects on society. For example, um, selling, oh, selling makeup to depressed teenagers. There's advertising that targets teenagers who've said that they're depressed on social media. And yes, they do buy more makeup. So the makeup companies are targeting them. Is that ethical? I'm not sure. So, <clears throat> opportunities. Um, a lot of what I've said about the, challenge, uh, about the challenges and risks uh, have been critical of digital media, um, of digital tools. But the participants that we interviewed also commented how there were opportunities that they could see. They could see the value of digital tools. Um, the extended mind thesis is, is uh, a theory that's well known in, in philosophy and psychology. And it says that the mind is extended by the use of digital tools. So, the use of the technology becomes an integral part of our thinking and reasoning processes. Um, Google searches are um, a normal part of the way that we think nowadays. It may not be a Google search, but it may be checking Wikipedia. Um, so these have become normal, and they have a value in extending what we can do and how we reason and think. Uh, secondly, personalised education was identified as a, a potential value. Maybe not quite there at the moment, but there's great potential for um, recommender systems um, and personalised education. For example, if you took Apple's Siri personal assistant and transferred that to an educational setting, you would have you know, a personal tutor. Thirdly, um, avatars in virtual environments have great potential. Well, actually, they're already being used for treatments, for phobias, um, for uh, changing people's attitudes, which is interesting. Um, and um, people do use them to explore issues of identity. And Finally, um, I will conclude by saying that um, we should engage in the public debate over who is responsible for digital media. Um, it's not a simple answer to the question of who's responsible. It's, to a certain extent, it is a personal responsibility. It is the digital uh, technology companies who are responsible. Um, government can play a role, and so can higher education institutions. We do need more research into ethics, uh, to critical digital pedagogy, which we heard about this morning in the keynote, and we need more impact studies that actually look at whether or not they're effective in changing people's attitudes and behaviours. Um, so, it could be a, a moral obligation, really, on us to, uh, as educators, as technologists, and in higher education institutions, to promote the digital well-being of not just our staff, who we're responsible for, um, but also the students that we're responsible for. Um, critical pedagogy suggests that if students live in a culture that digitizes and educates them through a screen, then they require um, an education that empowers them in that sphere, that teaches them that language and that offers them new opportunities of human connectivity in online learning environments. Okay. 
Um, I'll just finally say um, the project is currently developing a professional development course for educators in higher education, a teacher's pack with resources and a couple of apps um, for students and educators to help improve their digital well-being and digital literacy skills. Um, if you are interested in those, they will be released in April. So you can, uh, and there will be public showcase events um, in these locations. Um, and you can connect to us through LinkedIn group, through Facebook, or um, through the project website is there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so one of the really interesting questions that we've had on VVOX is whether um, you think digital well-being needs to be singled out as a specific problem or whether it sort of comes more under a general well-being topic now. Um, I think that general well-being is, it is important to educate people about general well-being. But I think as higher education educators, if we are encouraging people to use uh, digital um, environments, then we need to make sure that they're equipped to work in those arenas. Brilliant, thank you. Has anyone got any questions in here? Somebody on the VVOX is concerned whether we are creating students who can only interact digitally. Uh, well, I don't know about that. Um, I teach on distance learning programs, so I would be guilty of teaching students to interact only digitally, but that's not all the students that are in higher education. Um, so I hope we're not teaching them all to only be able to interact digitally, but I, I think we have to be realistic. The, um, Digital technology is here to stay. Uh, we need to use it in the best way, and we need to teach um, people how to be safe and um, use it responsibly. For sure, and I think one of the points at the very start of your presentation was about sort of the balance between working as well, and I think that comes into that as well, as getting people, encouraging people to have a good balance between online and offline. Absolutely, and I think you know, that's important for the staff as well as for the students. Uh, we have a responsibility to the students, but institutions also have a responsibility to the staff um, who are being ever increasingly encouraged to, to do things digitally. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Edina's work with learning technologists helps to develop skilled, data literate students who can change our world for the better. Teachers and students can develop and share coding skills with Notable, our Jupyter Notebook service. Our Digimap services deliver high quality mapping data for all stages of education. Future developments include a text and data mining service, working with satellite data and machine learning, and smart campus technology.